All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I guess whenever you guys are going to watch this to our Grail Country family here. So we have uh, an exciting discussion today, uh, continuing with Nate and I's overall series on uh, Bulgakov's commentary on the um, on uh, the Apocalypse of John. Uh, we actually have invited Chris Green. And Chris, if, if I get this wrong, please correct me. But you... Uh, my understanding is you're a pastor in the Pentecost with a Pentecostal background. Uh, you write over, you do a great sub stack called uh, Speakeasy Theology, which, by the way, if you haven't subscribed, definitely uh, make make that a point because there's some really wonderful work that Chris is doing in there. It's also a great name. It's a great name. It's one of the top names of of all of Substack. Yeah, yeah. Who, I saw that Jesse Jesse got a call out this week from. David oh, from, from David, I saw that. Yeah, copious flowers. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, who who wouldn't want to you know discuss theology in a psst, over here kind of <laughs> <laughs> framework? But it, um, that's right. I mean, not to interrupt the flow here, but like I, there's a story behind it. Like not just the name, but like wanting to recover a space that you have to kind of seek out on your own. Maybe we'll discuss that at some point. But yeah, I mean, so the name is wasn't just a cool thing I heard right I mean it very much emerged out of wanting to create a space online where the people who showed up there decided to be there yeah yeah <laughs> made some effort to show up there yeah well and, and a lot of your discussions over there I've had the chance just to kind of familiarize myself with it but it, you know it, it seems like a really interesting um, blend of kind of the charismatic Pentecostal approach that you have with some of the more ancient and specifically Eastern strands of Christianity, which I love. I wish, I'm telling you, Chris, I wish that the, I had the opportunity to find more communities, you know, that kind of embody both of those. That would be mm -hmm. uh, something that I would love to take part in. Of um, course, that that particular aspect, Jed, is near and dear to my heart because my my own background is very similar. I also come out of, you know, Pentecostal family and have found myself in, a continuing Anglican church. So we kind of have kind of have that in common. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I'm I'm with the Episcopal Church as well, but you know, consider myself more or less like a renegade Christian mystic. <laughs> you know? well, that, yeah, that's very much my brand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> meaning the one I want to sign up for. Now I, I think I think there's one of the things that I stumbled into, and Nate and I have talked about this a little bit, is you know, I was raised a Pentecostal kid, rural Oklahoma, you know, mm -hmm. working class, blue collar folk and a spirituality to match you know mm -hmm. and it wasn't until after i'd graduated from bible school planted a church and started to fall in love with theology that i started to learn that the spirituality that had raised me was a wesleyan holiness spirituality yeah and that once i found my way back to wesley that was the way to the Eastern fathers, right? That was the way to origin or to Ma even Maximus, but certainly Evagrius and, you know, but that Eastern, yeah. like Wesley's soul, you know, lots and lots of people have written about this, but I think like if you hear Wesley in that key, then you hear theosis, right? Yeah. You don't hear moralism, you hear deification. Yeah. And recognizing that, oh, this, it may seem odd to someone who's kind of walking by, mm -hmm. but in fact, it, it does hold together. So for me, I'm not so much going away from what I grew up with as, as going deeper into the roots of my own family tradition. I'm becoming more Pentecostal, not less. Yeah. As I become more ancient and more Eastern. Yeah. And I think that those are, I mean, those are interesting horizons that I think have opened up within Christianity. And Nate and I have talked about this quite a bit is um, you know, one of, you know, we talk about the the downsides of technology mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. they're certainly there. But one of the things that I've noticed for myself personally is that technology has facilitated access to a world of thinking and ideas that I, you know, I went to Moody Bible Institute. I come probably a little bit more Calvinistic Presbyterian, but with a, with a pinch of charismatic thrown in there, yeah. um, you know, is that we're raised in a very parochial understanding of what Christianity is. And really, you know, I, you know, had some exposure to Lutheranism, Catholicism, because we'd have to go to different churches for part of assignments, but it was always kind of like trying to suss out what was wrong with those traditions versus what was right with ours. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Right. But, you know, breaking like the, the internet has broken open that 
paradigm in a way that has enabled a lot of us. Like I would never have read um, Origin sympathetically or Evagrius or Maximus, you know, or any of the great, you know, uh, theological and spiritual masters within Christianity had I not been exposed to lectures and communities online that facilitate that. Absolutely. And so, you know, I, I think that that's one thing that is, that can't be overlooked in the, you know, our critique of technology and the advance of technology is that it also facilitates this. For me, it, it is the technological piece of a much deeper spiritual movement. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, so I, I've seen that and I'm sure that's, I mean, for Nate and I, I think our experiences are similar there. It's probably similar for you is just the exposure to these things is like a, it's like uh, waking up into a reality that has always been latent, you know, within our Protestant traditions in some way or another, um, but is not, uh, was never made explicit. Yeah. And so it's, it's, to me, it's like a learning different patterns of the faith and learning how to maybe step out into those in a new and exciting and creative way which certainly, you know, the, the Presbyterian and Calvinist side of me, that would have been verboten. Right. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. For, for us too. I mean, there, there are loads of folks I grew up with who wouldn't consider me a Christian now, much less yeah. a Pentecostal. Right. Yeah. I, mean, so, I, I certainly don't think that that has changed for everyone in the world, but for me, it has been a sense of restoration and reconciliation to my tradition Mm -hmm. not a breaking from it although it began as a breaking from it but I, yeah. I didn't experience deconstruction so much as a recovery of a family tradition you know, that, that I had lost or that we had lost yeah that I, I I try to bring that up often because there are so many people out there who are still caught either in traditions that are suffocating them in some way because of the, you know the parochialism you just mm -hmm. named it or they're caught between traditions. They feel like they're in no man's land between mm -hmm. being Presbyterian and Catholic or between being, you know, Baptist and Pentecostal or whatever the case might be. There's so many people right now, I think, don't know where they belong, don't know how to yeah. fit anywhere. And Robert Jensen, who's a huge influence for me, yeah, in, in, in part because of how learned he was, in part because of the way he wore his Lutheranism. So yeah. he would often say, you know, I'm an unreliable Lutheran. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a Lutheran, but I'm unreliably so because my devotion is to the future United Church, mm -hmm. right, yeah. to the visible unity of the future church that the spirit is bringing about. That's where my devotion lies. Yeah. And, you know, long before David Bentley Hart talked about tradition as apocalypse. Yeah. You know, Jensen had already taught me, right, that the way to be truly traditional is to do whatever you can do to bring about that future visible church, the visible unity of the church. That's not only you know, all Christians of that era living together in unity, but that the church showing, showing itself to have always been one. Mm -hmm. like that's what we're working toward. Yeah. But you can't do that from nowhere. Right. He would yeah. say, you know, I, I have to do this as a Lutheran because that's where God providentially mm -hmm. ordered my life to come into being and to, and my growth to happen. And yeah. so that, that for me, even though, no, you know, now I'm a Bishop in a continuing Anglican communion, I'm a Pentecostal kid and I will be till I die, you know, like that's, mm -hmm. I will always be because that's, that's where I was put. That's the language. That's my mother tongue. Right. Yeah. You know, Chris, it's taken me a long time to come to that realization, but I, I really, it's only in the last probably year or so that that has dawned on me that that's the case for me too. It's like, mm -hmm. there's no, like, it's, 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 it's just a part of a part of me in a way that um, it took me a long time to appreciate. So, I, th I think it should take a long time in, in that that needs to ripen, right? That, that can't, if it happens too quickly, you're probably forcing it. Mm -hmm. It needs to, needs to play out over the course of your life. But yeah, it is good when you can finally come to that piece or when it, when it's time for it, it is, man, there's a rest in it for sure. Yeah. Well, and there's that, there's something to be said for, I mean, you can talk about excess within any community, but you know, when, if, you know, I've, I've been able to be a part of some really powerful, you know, especially like prayer meetings with charismatics and Pentecostals and to be, you know, the recipient of like a life giving and timely word that just when somebody is, has an insight that there's no, there's no human way for them to have that insight and to be able to communicate that to you. Those are some of the things that, you know, even years later, 
I still, those are formative for me. Right. And, uh, and I think it's something that like, you know, para, you know, the Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity has to bring to the overall Christian community is that, that um, fresh and always, uh, you know, sometimes shocking move of the spirit. And um, yeah, yeah, I don't know if, if all of your listeners already know this, but there's an old book by James K. Smith called Thinking in Tongues. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read, if you're interested in kind of knowing what what the dna of pentecostalism is i think that gets it best oh i'm gonna have to pick up that title <laughs> yeah. we've, we've talked sure. we've had some interesting discussions here at grow country i think mostly with sherry um about speaking in tongues mm. and kind of what that is um that uh you know or one one way of looking at that that has yeah. been kind of cool. It, it, you know, if you, if you kind of rewind there to Pentecost and like what's happening is that this ecstatic utterance is coming out and then it's being heard, you know, mm -hmm. and I know there's different ways to speak in tongues. So it's, you know, this is just one way of looking at it, but is in a sense, it's the, the ability of the spirit to come in and serve as like that universal language and the translator of, you know, the, the locution to what is heard you know, what is said to what is heard and that there is something in it that lands. And so learning to speak in tongues to me is also like, it's a skill that is cultivated in the spirit mm -hmm. that enables us to deliver that timely word. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that what you just named there, and this is, this is one of the things I think Bulgakov does remarkably well is to see how one thing is another, but without in any way oblating what it is in that mm -hmm. others, what those things are in their mm -hmm. others. So when what the spirit is doing is not some universal language that ablates or obscures all other languages, mm -hmm. but that works in and through all languages, right? That that brings them up into a kind of transfigured flourishing that en enables us to understand each other without loss of what is distinctive to us. Yeah. And that is, you know, to me that's right at the heart of what he does in all of his work, like hold, hold that together, recognizing yeah. that that's what God's fullness does. That the way that I've come to say it is that the demonic possesses and dispossesses. Mm -hmm. So what it takes over, it takes over by driving out all of the goodness that was peculiar to that thing. Mm -hmm. It displaces the, the human mm -hmm. and possesses the body. Right. Mm -hmm. But what the spirit does is fill and fulfill. So mm -hmm. where the spirit is most fully present, that creature is most completely itself, most truly itself, even autonomously itself, right? So that self-control is a fruit of the spirit where the spirit is, is fully abiding, you know, Nate and Jed and Chris are themselves yeah. truly living the lives that they are willing to live. And I think that, gosh, like that's not the way that I was taught to think about the Christian life, but mm -hmm. Ironically, I think Pentecostals experienced it. They just couldn't talk about their experience well. They didn't name it very well. They yeah. couldn't, when they stepped away from it to describe it, they described something different from what they were actually doing. Well, yeah. and I, I think Chris, a lot of that is like we're a lot of a lot, a lot of a lot of people are just like, let's let's say your average Pentecostal in the pew isn't isn't doesn't know a lot and is interested, isn't interested in in learning a lot of theology so they're completely dependent on whatever is handed to them and just like faithfully repeating whatever is handed to them so there's a way in which we can understand why that would be the case i mean this has been my work over the last few months both as a bishop and as an academic and trying to show the ways in which what what happened to my folks is that we were in love with jesus which is good right mm -hmm. But we were in love with Jesus, the wonder worker, Jesus, the savior who died for our sins, the healer, even the storyteller, but not Jesus, the teacher. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know how to take doctrine and teaching seriously at the most fundamental levels. Right. So if we taught, we taught our peculiar teachings, right? Like the things that made us distinctive. Mm -hmm. That's what we taught. We did not teach the heart of the faith. I mean, I showed my students just a couple of days ago. In, in the 1980s, the Pentecostal Holiness Church, which is the denomination that 
that formed me in the churches that I was raised in. I, I attended a Pentecostal Holiness Church in the in the mid two thousands. By the way, there you so go. Right, I know so, the denomination. You know, it's one of the classical denominations, like the Assemblies of God, the Church mm -hmm. of God, the Church of God in Christ, mm -hmm. Four Square. And in the nineteen eighties, they had a statement about about doctrine, and they say, and this 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 is in the manual for all of their members that we affirm the historic Christian faith of virgin birth, resurrection, the Trinity, incarnation. But our emphasis has always been on the peculiarities of holiness and Pentecostal doctrine. And they're saying this, it's a kind of confession, right? Like we, this is one of the ways in which we failed catechetically. Now, they're not quite saying they failed, mm -hmm. but that is, it is a way of confessing it purposely or not, that catechesis is where we failed. And over time, like if you have a lot of people who are well catechized and then they're ignited by the experience of the spirit, that's one thing. And mm -hmm. right? it's one thing if you've got people who are deeply formed in the faith and also are open to the charismatic, open to the surprises of God, right? What you said, the, the sometimes even scandalous works of the spirit. That's, that's, I think, what you read in something like monastic literature i mean mm -hmm. anthony of the desert is, what is he if he's not you know a, a deeply catechized christian who's open to the weirdness of the world and and the wildness of god yeah but what happens over time when you do not catechize well is that you lose your bearings and now you can't tell the difference between the wildness of god and just wildness right between yeah. the strangeness of the spirit and just the weird yeah and i i said just you know to one of our priest the other day without the catechist the prophet eventually sooner than later becomes a false prophet like yeah. you have to have the catechetical work at the heart of the church's life and we just we didn't care about teaching if we cared about teaching it was either our distinctives or some peculiar revelation you know about about the book of revelation say or about well that that vocation of that vocation of teaching for the church is a vocation that extends it extends beyond it ought to extend beyond the church right like yes. that 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 the church should be an educative teaching force like in the world mm. as well as yeah, so um and it, it's something that i think uh gets lost very easily yeah well, and to, um, and, and to build and, off of that too. Oh, I'm sorry, Nate. Go ahead. No, it, I just going to say it's deeply connected to to our commitment to agopic love, which is a parental kind of love. Like mm -hmm. that's like, and and also to and also to valid Christian notions of hierarchy, which have to be a reflection of that. Where it's like it's not like you know you have to have hierarchy, but it's not for the purpose of lording over anyone. It's for their protection and care. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we should have a conversation sometime about Dionysius. I'm, I was talking with, not well. This is going to be a name drop. It's not meant to be, but Father John Bear and I are a part of a teaching team for the Open Table Conference. We're teaching through the Gospel of Matthew right now, and it just happened the other day. I found out that he's actually teaching a class right now on Dionysius, and I'm I've been reading him on my own for for something else. And it's mm -hmm. this this notion of hierarchy, Nate, like that it it has nothing to do with pecking order. Mm -hmm. It has right. nothing to do with who gets to say, who gets to have the last word. Where does the buck stop? It has everything to do with the ways in which the life of God flows into creation by us finding way, ways of coming into alignment with that, with that yeah. order of God. So, I mean, I think that it, there is a desperate need to recover. I mean, Dionysius invents that word for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Like that we, we need this language and Bishop Alexander, who's written a ton of stuff about, and he's one of the, primary translators for Dionysius he talks about the ways in which you can't understand Dionysius until you see the ways in which his mystical and apophatic theology mm -hmm. and his hierarchical understanding of the world are part of one and the same thing in Jesus the key mm -hmm. is to see that this is not some neo-platonist framing of the world in which we don't quite know where Jesus fits mm -hmm. this is a close reading of the life of Jesus as the one who is God and beyond God, who is yeah. good beyond good, right? Yeah. And is that in such a way that the goodness of God flows into the world, right? That, you know, the very hem of his garment yeah. is, is graced, his garments shine on the yeah. tape. You know, that this, yeah, I mean, I could go on forever about that. But I, I think what's 
to circle back to what we were discussing, I think that Pentecostal and you know people of the spirit, mystics in, in the broadest possible sense, experience this, but without a teaching charism, mm -hmm. and without a teaching office, you soon lose touch. You lose language for right. What you don't happening. know how to. You don't know what the meaning of your experience is, and you don't have words to express it, and you don't have a framework to put it in. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so well, then you can't tradition it. Yeah. So right. what is if you have if if you have a a powerful life altering experience, but you don't have a way of catechizing it, you can't tradition it well. And so then what people have to do is either imitate that experience, try to find ways to make their experience look like the experience you've had. That's what will hold the community together. Or then you simply have to put a value around something like intensity or frequency of experiences, right? You find substitutes for teaching mm -hmm. to hold the community together. And I think that's exactly yeah. what's happened to the Pentecostal traditions that have shaped us. In fact, one of the ways I've put it before is Pentecostalism was, and I think still is a movement that can, can never quite become a tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can never quite become a tradition because it doesn't have this catechetical grace. And I think huge, I know that we, I didn't come on tonight to talk about this, but I think like the 20,000 foot question is perhaps that's because Pentecostalism is not meant to be a tradition. Right. It's meant to serve the whole body and that we need then to align these kind of everyday street level mystics with teaching offices in the established churches maybe that's maybe that's the reason well and there's it's it i think it speaks to something that so like my exposure to charismatic christianity is here west coast and incredibly influenced by like the vineyard and the calvary yeah. chapel and the jesus movement in the 1960s and a lot of traditions kind of um, you know, kind of see their founding moments and then don't see much prior to that, right? Is that, you know, as Christians, we're, we're a trans-temporal community, which yeah. means we don't just exist in the future. We don't just exist in the past and we don't just exist in the present. But what the catechesis does is it, is it, it gives you an anchoring into your past. It helps you understand where you've come from. In a sense, it's, it's genealogical, you know, and, and it, in a sense, like facilitates that that more skillful speaking in tongues, right, is to be able to translate that that realm of pure experience into meaningful language that is spiritually formative. And, you know, I think it's really powerful, I guess. I mean, we could probably stick there and <laughs> have an entire conversation just on that. Yeah. Um, but I'll, before I jump into the questions I've prepared, I just you know, for you as like kind of a, a, you know, in pastoral ministry and as a theologian, what, what do you feel like maybe is one or two things that make Bulgaka a very attractive conversation partner for you? Oh man, there's so much. I think, <laughs> I think some of it is just the, the scope and complexity of his thought. Like he, he's able to hold so much. Mm -hmm. And he, sometimes I think it, it, feels like the weight of it is is kind of overwhelming like what all what all is happening at once mm -hmm. but there there's a a massive massive scope and yet once you once you start to read him and again i'm far from an expert but once you you've given a few years to reading him well you realize no 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 that there is an order here like he's not just saying a lot of stuff i mean my kind of initial impression was this is a creative mind who's just saying everything he knows at once right? <laughs> like it's just a, <laughs> an explosion it's almost like a, a i read it as a kind of big bang work like mm -hmm. there's just this enormous energy exploding mm -hmm. but who in the world knows what's happening right it's just ex explode energy exploding in every direction the more i've read him realized no there's some of that i think at play but there's there's a lot more order and structure than i could have possibly appreciated yeah. early on and again, I'm definitely do not want to suggest that I'm an expert by any means, but the more I read him, the more I feel like I, I start to know where I am in his universe. Like, the, okay, this, this is doing that. That's doing another. And, and yet it's still massive in its scope. And I, I think it's also so clearly suffused with a, a kind of mystical sensitivity and spirituality. Mm -hmm. 
And like for me, and, and this this is my Pentecostalism again. Uh, like I I love that. I mean, I love sensing that, and yeah. I find it moving. I know that at times it can, and and I, and I sense this too at times. You know, it can be it can veer close to the Pietistic, and I think this is especially true when he's younger. Like the 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 you can hear this in his sermons at times where it the you know for me at least the way that i'm using the words like pietism is kind of spirituality that's taking itself a little too seriously Mm -hmm. and there are times that that comes through and i and i know i recognize it because it's happened to me so many times Mm -hmm. Um, but but at the same time i i love that it's never cold it never feels distant Mm -hmm. for him you know like the his heart is in it as we say and I, i love that about him too so to have that kind of staggering scale of thought but suffused with with passion and with this clear love for god like i i find that deeply deeply yeah moving. yeah yeah he, he's a remarkable like when i first got introduced to him i got introduced to him through just some of the offhand remarks that i heard in one of david bentley hart's lectures on bulgakov being like one of the great theological binds of the 20th century and i was like oh i should probably read this guy and then i got into him I've, you know I ran aground on the reef of the introduction to lamb of god <laughs> it took mm-hmm. me about a month to understand it um but just found that like his his profound understanding of the relationship of god in the world you know through his sophiology was was incredible and then i um i began to see some of his how that fed into his understanding of eschatology and apocalypse um that were very kind of resonant with where my thinking was going it was it was so refreshing to see somebody who um kind of approximates something my my own views i would say is kind of a synthetic millennialism right Mm -hmm. that really you know tries to read revelation like the all millennials do with like a a sense of the symbolism of the text um but the post-millennials with their sense of mission that there's something to be accomplished but also the sense of the pre-millennial sense that there's a kingdom out there to be attained Mm -hmm. um and so to to see that especially within an orthodox framework was really shocking and also really um really refreshing Uh, but to to kind of to, to segue into the actual questions that I wanted to ask you, I wanted to, you know, kind of pull from T.S. Eliot here and, you know, in, my, in the end is my beginning, right, is to go to the, to the very end of the essay. And it's something that you actually um, cited here in your article, uh, Hope Must Be Born Again. So I'm going to ask you a question from the article here. But the, the last paragraph, and I'll go ahead and read it in length just to give some context for those listening, um, is this. So Revelation teaches us to pray for Christ's new advent into the world. The infant church knew this prayer and expected the Lord's coming quickly, meaning in a short space of time, not just that the time had grown ripe for it, united nonetheless to the complete unknowability of its season. One might say that she was inspired by eschatological hope. That hope may even have been sustained by the Lord's promise, depending on how, of course, it was understood. Verily, I say unto you, there may there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Whatever the true meaning of this text may have been, the first generations of Christians understood it in precisely that way. But gradually, as the first generation and others after it departed this life without having witnessed the long the longed for and promised parousia, eschatological hope grew less and less distinct and then was extinguished altogether. Such, it may be said, is the condition of all historical Christianity to our very days. All that is left is the state uh, that is left of this state of eschatological health is the fear of death and the reply that it must follow, follow into it judgment beyond the grave. This is how it is expressed in the prayer of the great litany. For a Christian end to our lives and a good answer at the dread judgment seat of Christ, let us pray. Mm -hmm. Revelation's prayer, come, remains unheard even now, yet it must be heard and one day answered. It must become not only an object of particular prayerful attention, but a new spiritual orientation. 
we are concerned with nothing more nor less than a new and at the same time primordial feeling of life, which must be born again in Christianity. And this must be a spiritual and prayerful turning point in the life of the church, not external, but internal. Impotence, diffidence, and inertia keep us from it, things which are taken for fidelity to tradition, but that very tradition is in need of renovation. The word of God to the church and about the church is applicable here in a special way. Behold, I make all things new. It is not that we who make it is not we who make it so, but God in us, in Christ, by the Holy Spirit, yet not without us. The voice once heard can no more be forgotten, and this call, once it has resounded in our souls, must remain not remain un unanswered. A new era is beginning in the life of the church. What this means in light of the present and future is not ours to know, but we must learn to think and feel eschatologically. Um, and then you make this interesting statement at the beginning of your article here in uh, in uh, Hope Must Be Born Again. I'm going to go ahead and read it here. Um, I grew up in an atmosphere charged with the dread of the end times. My earliest nightmares I can remember, three of them distinctly, were of the rapture. I did not, I do not move in those circles now, but as a rule, Pentecostals no longer live with that fear. That is all to the good. What is not good, however, is the lack of orientation and desire for the end. For so many of us, faith has, uh, has swallowed up both hope and love. There is no horizon of desire, no sense of longing for what is to come. The only thing that matters is our personal relationship with God, as if God were one thing as if God were one person among many and the only one we're truly meant to love, not to put a point on it too sharply, but faith is far too often construed as a means to an end of achieving our best life, a form of currency to be spent in turning God's will to our advantage. And so my question would say like, um, like, how do you think like Christian communities, like the communities that you're involved in can be enriched by the writings of Bulgakov, who calls for that renewed sense of both apocalyptic and eschatological thinking? I, I think the first and most important thing is what, what I named earlier as this, this passion for Jesus, this love for God as he's given to us in Jesus, mm -hmm. matched with this ready readiness to say all that needs to be said. What what he does what he does so not that I you know I think at the end of the day he gets everything right, but what Bulgakov is always striving to do is to say all that he thinks needs to be said. He doesn't stop short. He doesn't let himself say this is what I care about and I'm going to leave the rest unsaid. Mm -hmm. You know it's it's a it's fully committed to we need to say this, but we need to say it in such a way that it also allows us to say that right. So for instance, you know he'll say. When, when we're praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, that we have to say it. There's something that's being prayed there. And it's something that if it's being prayed, it has to be answered. God mm -hmm. would not be giving us this prayer to pray if there weren't some answer to it. And yet that's not quite, can't quite be praying for the coming of the Lord in that apocalyptic end of all things sense, because the answer then would lie beyond this world. It would be quite literally the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So we have then to say there is a coming of the Lord that is going to, as I would put it, happen two time, not in time. Mm -hmm. And because it's going to happen two time, it's going to change everything mm -hmm. forever, right? And yet there's a coming of the Lord that must happen in time so that the coming of the Lord to time and the coming of the Lord in time rhyme so that what's happening to us, so to speak, from the outside, mm -hmm. eternity taking us up into the life of God. Like, that's not a point on the timeline. That's something that's happening to the whole timeline. Mm -hmm. And yet there are things happening on the timeline that we are praying for and can and should expect. So there's a way in which the our es to, to think and feel eschatologically is to believe that there are things that we do in this world that matter mm -hmm. and that need to be done, right? that there's a maturation. Mm -hmm. There There is a, a way in which what the church does, and this, this goes to your point, Nate, about about loving the world in such a way that the church's teaching is serving the larger world, not just other Christians, mm -hmm. certainly not other Christians in our circles, but serving the world, serving our non-Christian neighbors. 
like that we we have that responsibility and that the way history plays out is contingent upon how faithful we are mm-hmm. and that he's able to say that that the future will be as bright or or as dark as we are faithful mm-hmm. at least in a sense right like there's it, what we do have real consequence in the world at that scale right people there, say that. and also can't... But, yeah, and also say, right, we have to say that, and we also have to say, without the coming of the Lord, all of this will be tragic, even if we are successful, right, even if we do make some positive difference. So but that's a, just an example, but he's able to do that both and work mm-hmm. in ways in which all of it still, again, is shot through with, and either way, we love this Lord who's called us, right, whether it's the burden that we feel to to labor for a future that's more just or praying for the coming of the kingdom of God, which is beyond what we could imagine as just. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way to do all of that at once. And I think to me, that's what he, it's, it's that more than anything else that he gives us, right? That, Mm -hmm. that kind of heart and mind that have been integrated and are just, you know, again, to go back to my image of the big bang, like he is just, exploding with energy mm-hmm. around this devotion to the to jesus who works all things in all hmm. Sorry, a, Nate, there, yeah, no 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 problem there's a, there's a, i i i just want so there's something that you said in the first essay let me let me read the text but uh, actually i think you're quoting bulgakov yeah you are it, it's, it's a quoted passage this part stuck in my mind However, it directs our gaze beyond such concretization, focuses our thoughts, and turns our love to Christ coming into the world with the unceasing remembrance of his coming. Mm. That remembrance must know no interruption, no relegation as something not contemporary or premature. That's that, but that remembrance part, like that really, that that use of the word remembrance really struck me for a couple of reasons. First of all, we have the words of the mass, like do this in remembrance of me. And this is this is the thing that's interesting. So even Christians who have like, let's say a low view of, of, of the Eucharist, don't take the, they, they do not take those lines, do this in remembrance of me seriously enough or understand what remembrance entails. Because I think what, what he means there is some sort of amnesis. It, yeah. it, and, and also... There's a like uh, Tomberg has Tomberg, and I think correctly so. He connects he connects both sleep and death to forgetting. Mm. So mm. It, it, it Christ in being life, like life itself, is really like this idea of remembrance is is deeply connected to the sense of Christ as life. Mm. Well, yeah. and what's interesting with that, Nate, too, like, and I, I is to to delve a little deeper into just the the notion of remembrance, right? Because it's it's most natural corollary is incarnation, and it's one of the one of the few terms that like so the Hebrew word for for remember is a car, right? Uh, and yeah. in English remember, and it, what's interesting is they both carry a very similar connotation which is it's a very masculine process of remembering and it, it's it's even like in its original etymology kind of phallic in its <laughs> in its sense of what it's talking about but is deeply tied to incarnation and to embodiment is like to remember me is to embody what christ came to embody and um and that is something that whether you know, whatever your kind of your view on, on the sacraments might be is like, that's what, that's functionally what they're trying to drive us to is to be incarnating that, that life in the spirit in the world through our active memory that brings that past and actualizes it here and now. And there's those weird, like, like inversions in, in time that, you know, John's, you know, the apocalypse, the way it's structured is he goes up and he has these visions and there's no record of him coming back down. Like, obviously he had to have come back down out of those visions, but he's in this heavenly area that, you know, in this heavenly dimension, the throne room that we see in Revelation four and five, he never actually leaves that. So when is John having that vision? And it encompasses, you know, his moment in time all the way to the final end of all things. Mm-hmm. When is he having that vision? It's now, right? 
John's having that vision as we speak in the heavenly courts. You know, we're, we're getting a temporal marker of that, you know, in the written testimony that we have of the book of Revelation, but the, the vision is an ongoing reality. And so those, those concepts of, you know, the second coming or the millennium and these kinds of things are not just a discrete moment in time, but are realities that are informing and impinging upon all of time. Yeah, yeah and Chris, that's you, actually, oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris, go, go for it. We're here to talk to you. You talk. <laughs> well, this is this is a sign of a good conversation. I love it. I, I think Christologically what we can say is that God, of course, does not have memories, right? God, there, God does not have a past in that way or, or, mm -hmm. or a future that is other than God himself. Mm -hmm. Jesus has memories, and he has memories as the one who is fully present to them. So one of the ways that I, I, I've said it in class is that Jesus' memories are for him rememberings. And we need this difference between, you know, when Jesus says, do this for my remembrance, he doesn't mean do the Eucharist so you will remember the way that you remember. Because mm -hmm. we weren't there. And he's certainly not saying do this so that it will be as if you were there. Right? Don't, don't do this mass to remind you of what was there when I did it, because again, we weren't there. He's also not saying even less. So do this because it's a kind of object lesson of what I did, right? This is a way to trigger for you something that could have been remembered. If you have been there, he's not saying that at all. It's participate in this way in my remembering mm -hmm. of what happened because his remembering is what's giving it. It's happening. Mm -hmm. It's happening because he remembers it. Mm -hmm. Right. So for, for, you know, th that image of Christ being baptized, not to wash away his sins, but to make the waters holy for our washing, mm -hmm. Jesus obeying his mother precisely so that in his obedience to her, she is being enabled to obey and we are being able to obey. Nothing happens to Jesus, but what he wants to happen differently for us. Like he has a past as this man, Jesus, mm -hmm. precisely so that in his memories of it, they can be brought up into the remembering of God that in the Israel scripture means God's answer to our prayers, right? When we cry out, God, remember us, mm -hmm. what we mean is answer our prayers, act in ways that bring your reality to bear in the world. So I, I think if we take that with, with absolute seriousness, then this call to do the Eucharist in remembrance of Jesus is our way of being caught up into his knowing of things right into his remembering of all things his generation generating of all things in in his experience of it right so that what the wonder of the eucharist then right is not primarily noetic and or or even symbolic although it is of course symbolic but is actually a participation eschatological participation yeah. in god's knowing of his own life and ours yeah. yeah, I think participation is absolutely mm -hmm. the key, the key mm -hmm. word there. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's an, it's an interesting, um, like, it, there's so much that we, it's tantalizing because it's there in the New Testament, right? So yeah. Paul has these really lofty statements that we have been raised up with Christ and we're seated with him now. Yeah. And so we are participating in the ascended life now, now you know, you give me, you know, of my 24 hours of the day, I might have 30 seconds where I have some awareness of that. Sure. Um, but we are participating in that. And so the, 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 the role of memory for the Christian is also that we've been ascended into that supra temporal realm that Christ is in. And so that encompasses time itself. So for us, remembering him is also in a sense, remembering who we truly are. Definitely. And, and that's a, it's something that once you realize that the kind of the malleability of time and that it's not really the final state of things, mm -hmm. um, whatever that final state is, it's hard to say, because our, our only experience on earth is in time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does well, draw us upward into like kind of a new way of thinking and being when you realize it's like, well, yeah, I have this, this kind of phenomenological experience of time, but I, like ontologically I exist within it and beyond it. Yeah. Just, I mean, I, I know we're on the same page here, but I, I don't think 
it's quite right to say that our only experiences are in time because I think one, we dream mm -hmm. two, we're children. And as children, we don't, I mean, this is one of the things that's adorable about our children, right? When they, when they, their speech and their sense of themselves are not neatly temporalized, right? Mm -hmm. Like they don't, they don't quite yet have the different differentations, differentiations to be able to say, this is that, and this happened mm -hmm. then, you know, to, to give a, a silly example is, you know, we just did a road trip. My youngest, who's 10, he still doesn't have a sense of how long we've been in the car and how much longer we have to go, right? If it's a 10-hour <laughs> trip, we could be 30 minutes in. And he's like, are we almost there? We've been here forever, right? I don't think that he's, like, we, it's funny and it's cute, but it's telling us something true about his experience. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which the time he's experiencing is different from the time that I'm experiencing. And I think that on that kind of continuum. Well, even as adults, Chris, we have experiences of time that do not like the yeah. way we experience time does not match the, if you were to measure the amount of chronological time that passed, it doesn't match our experience of the time. So yeah. we have these experience of time that even as adults that we have that are like suggest that there's more to it than the way we go about thinking about time in, in our day-to-day -day lives yeah. yeah and i think this is a major part of what the scriptures have to say about jesus so you know the, there's this passage in john where his, his his family is trying to get him to go up to jerusalem and to, to kind of play his trump card like go up to the to the feast and announce to everyone who you are and he says, like, my hour has not come. Like, your hour is always here, but mine is not yet. And then he later he goes. Right? And that's where he makes the announcement that, you know, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And I, th I think like that we need to take that more seriously than we do, right? That Jesus is living time differently than his brothers around him were, than, than anyone else around him knew. Mm -hmm. That and it was precisely that that enabled him to be present mm -hmm. and not to live with a bad anticipation. Like, so when we think about, he knows uh, taking the gospels account seriously, he knows for a long time, perhaps all of his life, what's coming at the end. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be killed. But he never lets himself effectively get caught by that. So when we get to Gethsemane, and he's sweating blood and crying out in great agony, terrified and mm -hmm. begging his friends to be there with him. He's finally arrived at the moment in which that's what's required. But he wasn't doing that the week before or the month before as we would be. Right. Yeah. So I reason I'm pressing this point of experiencing time is I would say two things. One, I think if we pay attention to our experience, time is not consistent for us. Mm -hmm. I think that Jesus is really the only one who's experienced time. Like we're all experiencing it in ways that are either immature or actually fractured. And the thing we're experiencing, not just our experience of it, but the thing we're experiencing is something else. It's fractured for us, right? Mm -hmm. This is where I think our, our doctrines of angels and principalities, all of that has to come in, you know, beyond the scope of this conversation. But mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it's very much in Bulgakov's scope, right? I mean, like he's not going to talk about any of this without mm -hmm. talking about. So th this is one of the things, you know, several years ago, I gave a lecture on the fallenness of wisdom. That I think wisdom is fallen, including the wisdom of time. There's a way in which whatever we mean by time itself, right? Whether you, you think that's just a subjective state or there's something objectively there, temporality, like all things... I think have been affected by what we call the fall. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that Jesus is the one who shows us what it is to experience time. And that what you see when you look at him is, is this sense of unhurriedness. At, and yet when it's time, when it's time, he can hurry, right? Mm -hmm. When, when there's a, you know, when there's what you do, do quickly, what you do, do quickly. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and Bulgakov draws our attention that there are times in which we pray and there's nothing about, there's no temporal scale imaginable for it. And then there are other times in which we're saying, no, come and come quickly. Yeah. And that, I, I think this is what, I don't know. I don't know if this is making matters 
better or worse. But I, I do think it's worth making that distinction, right? That Jesus is experiencing time mm-hmm. in ways that are true that we, that we do not. Much as Jesus' experience of food, uh, of the air, the water, like I think his, he knows creation in its wisdom as he intends it. Mm-hmm. And we do not. Right. Yeah. And I think it has to do with like, there's, there's a way that w- in which our, our limited experience of time is chronological time is it it's tied to our experience of, of finitude, I think as well, which yeah. is I, one of the earliest talks we did on real country was we like about two years ago, we had this conversation about, um the passage where um it says that 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 jesus was basically he was made sad by the fact that the apostles hearts were hardened about about what he did with the loaves right yes yes and that like and i've never heard a sermon on that before and to me like that is precisely pointing out like that we're are are being hung up on like not being able to see beyond this finitude, which is also tied to our experience of chronological time, which is ex- which is tied to what you're talking about, the different way Jesus experienced it. Absolutely. I mean, I say in one of those essays, I don't remember which one it is. I think most of us, and by us here, I, I really mean the Christians I know. Of course, I'm just, I mean, how would I know more than that? But the folks that I feel like I, I get where they're coming from, I think for most of us, we think of the coming of Jesus, the kingdom of God, the end of all things as the triumph of one finitude over another. Yeah. You say that in one of the essays. Yeah. 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 God's finitude is still a finitude. It's just a better one than ours, perhaps a larger one, but still a finitude that's going to triumph over ours. That's going to, again, displace or dispossess. And do we have, I don't know that we can avoid thinking about it like that. Right. It's very hard for us to not think about it like that because we don't really like in the idea of infinity or some alternative to finitude. It's like we something that we can only understand apathetically. There is no, there's no conceptual frame for us. Yeah. This is where Dionysus comes in and helps us. Other bit. than I would say what we were talking about <laughs> earlier, which is are, are those weird experiences where we just, where we don't experience things in that normal way that kind of like mm-hmm. snap us out of that at least for yeah. a moment so yeah. that we can like so that we can see oh there is something beyond this experience yeah so there, there are two two things that jump to mind there's a in one of the fragments of heraclitus there's this and i can't quote it exactly but there's this image about the mixture and there's a there's a drink and you you guys may be able to quote this for me but there's a there's a, a kind of concoction right that he says it is what it is only as it is stirred rightly Right, the, this drink is, it's not what's made up by the ingredients. It's what's made up by the the, the particular mixing or stirring of it. I, I'm thinking about that because in reading Dionysius and the the ecclesial hierarchy, I got to just really quick, just quick aside because it's funny. As a, as a, as a former chef, I cannot help but think about making an omelet when you say that because mm. the making of an omelet has nothing to <laughs> uh, making of a proper omelet has nothing to do with the ingredients. It, it's like the ingredients are eggs and some salt, maybe some white pepper if you want to be yeah. really fancy. Uh, it's all it's... about the way. <laughs> it's all about the technique. It's like entirely about the technique. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but that it is something else. So I, here, here, I'm saying maybe we do experience infinity or something that approximates it enough that we can be cataphatic even in the midst of the apophaticism. And I think Dionysius does this right. So. Right. In the ecclesial hierarchy, you know, we, we start with baptism, the rite of illumination, we come to the Eucharist, and then right at the center, we come to the altar on which we get the, the concoction, we get the chrism, we, we get the confection of the anointing oils, that, and then Christ is the altar, Christ is the, the sacrifice on the altar, he's the anointed one, and then that flows out in ordination into the world and even to the dead right so we move out through the ranks of the hierarchy through the monastic orders into the burial right and that's how the ecclesial hierarchy works like you move into the altar and the anointing and you move out so if we take the anointing right what are we experiencing there in that concoction in that in that making 
I think it's something that if it doesn't completely break our finitude, it does alter the way that we're experiencing finitude. And it's telling us that there can be mixture that's something new, right? So, and if you come back to Bulgakov, like that both, and, there's a way of doing the both and. We have to say this and that, and this, and that, and this, and that. It's still finite, of course, but it's bearing witness to something that is starting in that mixture, in that concocting, in that confecting. It is moving us into, and it's opening our finitude up, I guess is the right. way to say yeah, right? yeah, it, yeah. It's allowing it, our finitude to breathe in ways that open us up to the infinite. And I think that that's what his work does so, so, so well, right? It, yeah. It's a confection. Yeah. Well, and there's like a, there's an interesting, um, so I, it's interesting to see how like physics in a sense recapitulates metaphysics. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. there's a, there's a great author on the subject of time. He's a, he's a physicist by the name of Carlo Rovelli. And he, yeah. he wrote a book called the order of time and it's brilliant. Um, yep. His books. I know kinda... about this because of Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah, then, Jordan yeah, Jordan. Physics. yeah. yeah so <laughs> You know, but for, and Ravelli has this really powerful statement in the order of time. He says very simply and blatantly, time is our ignorance. Mm. And then he goes through and it's more on, the, you know, a treatise on the physics of time is once you kind of drop beneath all of the quantum fields and forces and particles, time evaporates. It literally disappears. And so that timelessness that, that, he doesn't really touch much on the metaphysical side of it, but that timelessness is a fundamental of our own experience. You know, just at the physical level, there is something within each of us that is beyond time. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the, the time is, is essentially like in his rendering is, is framed entirely within the second law of thermodynamics. And it's about heat loss and heat transfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, but yeah. then but then you get into kind of the metaphysics of the whole thing and, and the idea, the notion of like the divine energies that are kind of ceaseless. Yeah. Right. Is that there there must be something beneath that experience of time that speaks to what time truly is. And it's it's a really fascinating thing. I, I wanted to to kind of shift gears into another yeah. um, aspect of Bulgakov that I think is really interesting and kind of explore him in tandem with. This one of your little ones here? Yeah, this is Emery. Emery, hey, pleasure nice to meet to you, bud. You. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. Headed to bed. I love you, buddy. Love you Rest too. Well. Have a good evening. <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, but one of the um one of the one of kind of his co-religionists would would be Nicholas Berdayev. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I wanted to kind of pull Berdayev in because in the essay, even so come. Bulgakov will talk about our synergistic participation in these ends and these endings, right? The, the eschatological, which is at the far end of the general resurrection of the dead. And then Bulgakov will draw that into the apocalyptic, which is kind of this, this advent of this millennial kingdom that he, I think takes, he reads that symbolically. Um, but uh, so I wanted to bring in Berdayev because he uh, he's, he's one of the best writers on human creativity yeah. that I've ever read. And so I want to pull that in and then I'll kind of dive into the question from here. But uh, I've got that little set of essays, Creativity Will Save the World. And this comes out of his, um, one of his essays called Three Epochs, Creativity and the Christian Renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, so he says this, and this is a little bit of an extended quote, but uh, to overcome this um, religious servility is the first task of a Christian Renaissance. We must know ourselves not as the slave of God, but as free participants in the divine process. Christianity has not yet fully been revealed as a religion of love. Love is new, creative life, a life of grace in the spirit. It can never be an object of education or morality. Love is not a law and no one can be compelled to love. With the third, the creative epoch, there is closely related a sense of the end, an eschatological perspective on life. In the third epoch, the epoch of religious creativeness, all ends and limits of the world's life and culture will be manifest. The creativeness of that epoch will be directly will be directed essentially toward the final rather than the penultimate 
all its achievements must not be symbolic but realistic, not merely cultural but of the whole of life. The religious center of gravity will be transferred from the clerically protective to the prophetically creative. But a prophetic religious experience cannot be an experience of passive expectation. This is an experience of active, creative striving, of great anthropological tension and effort. We cannot merely passively await the coming of Christ. We must be up and go toward Christ. The sense of the apocalyptic will lead to a new religious life only if it becomes actively creative instead of passively expectant. The coming of Christ, in which the absolute man will be fully revealed in all Christ's power and glory, is connected with our creative act, with an active anthropological revelation. Mankind's Christological nature will be revealed in our creative act. The coming of Christ, the coming of Christ will come only to a humanity which courage, courageously accomplishes a Christological self-revelation that is reveals in its own nature, divine power and glory. Christ will never come in power and glory to those who are not creatively active. They will never see the second face of Christ. God will eternally turn toward them the crucified, tortured, and sacrificing face. To see the face of Christ in power and glory, we must reveal power and glory in ourselves by a creative act. And so... Um, so Bulgakov, like he's very intent on this. This is a huge part of his his writing, and it's it's also very present within Bulgakov. Is this this vision of the end is meant not only to help us, you know, Christianity, you know, in Berdyaev's rendering does solve the sin and death problem, right? And so that's already kind of been solved. But then we've been here for now, you know, almost two thousand years, just kind of waiting. <laughs> and like what why is it why is this not coming why is the you know why has this long anticipated arrival not come and, and he he makes some pretty bold statements that it hasn't come yet because we haven't taken up our vocation as as co-creators essentially and so you know with with bulgakov with his view toward the end and kind of berdayev here is like how do you see kind of a shift maybe away from that left behind late great planet earth understanding of apocalypse and eschatology into this this more of this renewed and sociological understanding of eschatology and the apocalyptic how might that be useful in inculcating a sense of creativity within our christian communities yeah i mean this is where you know stay on the theme we've been on like i think we have to confect this in a particular way like what, what we do not want to do. And so you, you mentioned these terms earlier, Jed, that this, this kind of amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial paradigm. What I would argue is those are three competing finitudes. Mm -hmm. And that Christian theology that settles on any one of them is, is already mistaken. That what we need to do is confect theology by holding all of them together. How might the, I don't know why this word is coming up for me. Um, I've been reading David Burrell. That's why. Um, the the because you know he passed a couple of weeks ago. The, how might the grammar of Christology allow us to confect a theology in which we sound postmillennial at times, millennialist at times, and at other times, a premillennialist at times, at other times, all millennialist? Like, mm -hmm. I think all of that has to be not not in ways that are incoherent, but that again are concocted, that are mixed, so mm -hmm. that. Yes, it is what I, what Bergadi is saying. I want to say amen to. And if someone else got up right behind him and said, if you mishear what he just said, it will lead to a tyranny of poetics in which you know, create sh creativity for creativity's sake is all that there is to life. That the second face of Jesus turns out to be one that makes us forget the face of the crucified. Yeah. And what we need to say is that the second face of Jesus is the face of the crucified. Mm -hmm. seen as his mother saw it mm -hmm. seen as john the beloved saw it something like that right do you mind this... if i say something really quick i think yeah. the remedy to that the remedy to that and and and, I, and a, i'm not sure about what bradyev meant but the remedy to that is to remember what what god and we are supposed to be in the business of creating and that is persons we mm -hmm. <laughs> because not only does god create us but we also create each other yes. like the way the way that we interact with one another and relate to one another creates the people that we are and the people that we become yeah 
and that like the primary thing being created in the creation is person so if you read that creativity to be to be about the business of of creating persons which is what the divine activity is for sure if we are also supposed to be engaged in that which i think is that is the highest and greatest form of creativity and these other things that we are, are call creative are only creative in as much as they connect to that and in fact there are ways in which we can use those other things we call creative to aid the primary act of creation mm -hmm. well what i love what you're saying nate there is you know Rahner's rule that if if what god is doing is creating persons it's because god is persons in this creative relation Right, that right. the, these subsisting relations are the create the creativity, the creation, the creating the creation of persons, right? Who share in that image, share in that energy. So yeah, I think I think you're 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 absolutely right about that. And I I don't know if I can articulate it well. I'm pretty sure I can't. But I think there's this um, you know there's this this line in that in that quote, Jed, about God's power and glory like answering to our own, like there's a way in which we have to come into our own power and glory for us to see God's power and glory. I think that's absolutely right. But then immediately I go to Graham Greene's power and the glory and this priest who finds that in his own degradation and loss, right? his own estrangement. And I, I'll just keep coming back to everything depends on how we mix this, like how we concoct it. And well, do we back to, right. the, do we keep, the, so he, the point of the saying, at least as I read it, is the moment you stop stirring it, the drink isn't itself anymore. Like you, you can't at any moment stop because then, then you're just back to the ingredients, right? You're back to this plus this plus this. It's, it's precisely the confecting, the way in which we're mixing it, that we start to give some witness to what it is that God is doing. So I, I mean, obviously... We need to put the we need to leave behind the left behind eschatology. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an eschatology. It, it isn't really. That, that's not well, it's just it's kind of this this wistful pining for some sense of being on the right side of history. And that, you know, we we'll get vindicated and everybody else is going to get their comeuppance. And yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's you know what's horrible to use that language of find it, it is very dark. And if we use that language of one finitude triumphing over another, what we're saying there is just crudely my finitude being made everyone else's finitude yeah which is you know just a, a form of violence and that's there's that's something violence. here about this discussion about about creativity and persons and and finitude and the distinction between a person and an individual because there's a i think that it's right. very easy to see how an individual is clearly a fi is clearly finite right an individual is definitely that's a finite thing but a person is but a own. person is not Yes. Well, they're not in, you know, in in like you know, put it in Gregory's terms, they're they're an infinite entelechy. They're they're an everlasting. Right. You know, they're epic static in their orientation. So there's no, it's it's uh, infinitude in the finite mode, right? As and there's there's the there's a sense of that, and I think that you know when we look at kind of the the cultivation of the person to kind of back up Chris to one of the things that you'd said is like, we don't want to lose, lose sight of the face of the crucified Lord. And I think Berdiah would no, oh, yeah, agree. He, he certainly would. But I, I think that we miss here. To your, but to your point, like one of the things that, and anybody who's ever undertaken a creative endeavor already knows this is kenosis is inherent to the process, mm -hmm. Right. Like the, this call to creativity is a call to kenosis because it is the, the is the literally the emptying of yourself outside of yourself that the creative act is actually consummated. And um, and I think that one of the things that, you know, for me as a lay person, and I will probably, Lord willing, always be a lay person. I, you know, once upon a time had thought about going into clergy, but uh, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed life at the bars more than I enjoyed life. Maybe you could join me over in estuary world. I think you'd make a great estuary host. Although maybe if you end up back in San Diego, Sacramento doesn't have a need for one because Paul's there, but 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm stuck in the in between like trying to be an Episcopal, trying to be a Vedantist and trying to be a wizard, you know, so I got <laughs> I got to triangulate between those. But um but yeah, like this creativity, like I think that this is like remarkably concrete in Christian communities because we've been kind of dominated with one form of clericalism, whether it's informal clericalism of the Protestant experience or more of the formal experiences in the older traditions, is that like there's a there's a Christianity that we leave to the pros, right? And um, it it removes that kind of the adventurous novice spirit that is kind of the seedbed of all creativity. And realistically, in the formation of persons, whether that is a Christian homemaker understanding that their creative call is bound up within their ability to facilitate a Christian home um, to an educator or somebody that's within the their vocational calling, whatever that happens to be, is that's the impetus where creation can happen. But it's it's self-conscious, like creativity is purposive. Like it's not just an accident. You might be able to get creative inspiration, and that's look like realistically for any creative person, that's a dime a dozen. Those moments happen all the time, but you're not necessarily writing a poem or a book or making a painting of every creative idea you have. You actually have to do something. Mm -hmm. And I think that that creativity is something that um, would be welcomed among you know your average rank and file Christian that's sitting in the pew that it's like beyond showing up on Sundays and, you know, maybe on Wednesday nights or whatever it is and sitting up and standing down and sitting up and standing down when they're supposed to, and saying the words that they're supposed to in the course of the liturgy is if that's not connecting to something that I then go out and bring out into the world, then we've done, we've really done a disservice to our brothers and sisters who are, who are called into that grand adventure. Right. Well, and so yeah, I agree. I agree with that. But I, I'm going to always come back to our failure is not. It, it's our failure is the failure of catechesis mm -hmm. in bearing witness to what is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a way again, we got to say a lot at once. We have to mm -hmm. say there are things that are not happening because we're not doing them. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there are lots of folks in my world who are waiting on God to do for them the things that their neighbors were waiting on them to do. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so, you know, we think about you know, conflict in the middle East or something else, like we're waiting on a, a kind of deo, deus ex machina act. Uh, mm -hmm. People in my world, I mean, like mm -hmm. God to do some kind of miraculous intervention, send the angels to do X, Y, or Z. And we aren't taking up our responsibility to do what needs to be done now right so i completely agree with that and it is possible for the the liturgy to become the end in itself and therefore to lose itself the clerical mm -hmm. i mean I'm, I'm too close a reader of Rahner not to know i mean look at the prayers at the end of Rahner's life his prayers against clericalism mm -hmm. and feel the pain in that right and bulgakov personally knew some of that i mean look at what happened to him at the end of his life right the ways in which his own priesthood and life get caught up in the politics of of the you know his world and the orthodox church at the time so i i completely agree with all that i just want to immediately go on to say but so much of so much of that is a failure of recognizing what is already happening right that that is there is a way in which christ is is acting and when we are creating, when we are, when we step fully into responsibility, when we do what needs to be done, I I think Scripture shows and history shows the moment a saint steps into a space and lives a saintly life, what happens is we start to recognize all the good that was already happening, mm -hmm. that was happening beyond the bounds of what where we expected it to happen, mm -hmm. and we recognize that that's how that saint saint's life was possible so gratitude being humbled before the work of god like the saint does not arrive and then suddenly everything is put right mm -hmm. the saint arrives to show you how all of this rightness and goodness was and is happening mm -hmm. to testify against the conventional for sure but to to draw our attention to man there there's so much creativity breaking out all around us and the, you know Dionysius again helps us here, right? That his sense of hierarchy is not 
a pecking order in which you know you get slow gradual movement from more to less right so that's not it's, trickle down economics it's not yeah somebody said this the other day to me <laughs> this is not trickle down anointing right mm -hmm. this is not not what's happening it's not trickle down mm -hmm. spirituality it's not trickle down sacramentality mm -hmm. right? but that jesus because he's the one who works all in all that in every point along the hierarchy from the demon possessed to the, the thrones right mm -hmm. everything along that hierarchy jesus is fully present to right so the fullness of christ is present to legion the one mm -hmm. we call legion just as surely as he's present to gabriel and michael and anyone else and if we lose sight of jesus that's where we get this these problems of bad finitude right mm -hmm. in which now we necessarily have competition and rivalry and hierarchy as pecking order pecking order and trickle down economics and trickle down mm -hmm. you know ecclesial authority or whatever else it'd be so again we're back to we need the kind of catechesis as confection that keeps this stuff stirred for us so that we're never allowed to let one finitude sit in rivalry with another because that's not who jesus is Right. The way he knows and and I think it helps to keep I, I think if we remember to think like to me, it's like the, the church is clearly meant to be a household. Mm. Like that's why I mean, you've got a collar on right now. That's yes. like that's why your parishioners call you father. Right. That's not, that's not an accidental or arbitrary decision that the church has made yeah. to have the priest called father like the church is the household of God. Yes. And in as much as we see the church as a household whose business is the creation to be engaged in the creation of persons, which is what a which is what a parent does, literally, yep. right? Then we aren't gonna then we aren't gonna run into problems with clericism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, yeah. and like to, you know, and, and this is where Jordan Wood is so helpful with I mean, he he drops so many like just almost like reality shattering statements but i remember and he made this in an offhand comment i think it was like in in one of his interviews um but talks about how we are creating the world in our experience of it yeah right it's through our experience of the world that the world is being shaped so you could take a small experience that you know to us might seem small giving a child a cup of cold water mm -hmm. right Yep. that is minimal effort but has maximal has a maximal effect because that cup of cold water for the thirsty child may be life-saving you know what i mean is yes. we're not talking about like you know when we're experiencing the world there's a there's a sense of like uh, the purposiveness and the intentionality that the christian call to discipleship entails yes that oftentimes we think well you know creativity is just going to happen in like you know some sort of bolt of lightning from the sky and then i'm going to have all that i need to go and do the things that i'm supposed to do and it's like no that's that's really not how it works mm -hmm. and if you know about creativity if you're composing let's say it's symphony or you're working on a novel it's grinding hard work <laughs> it's not like the the inspiration is the easy part you know just kind of like uh you know the inspiration aspect of making a baby making is the fun part you know then you've still got kids you gotta raise right you know um same kind of thing and i and i do think that the um th this is just my perspective chris so this is not i don't necessarily not necessarily gleaning this from uh bulgakov or, or berdayev but you know we're living in really chaotic times where it is very easy and probably not totally inappropriate to think apocalyptically or to think eschatologically yeah. but we we find ourselves in a in that same kind of setting where creation is upended it's formless and void just like it is at the you know at the very beginning waiting this creative breath to come upon it now it's already happened and it's happening but then we have the that responsibility in the present to continue in that work mm -hmm. and and i think that the um you know some of the things that like Berdaya will talk about the coming third testament which is you know anthroposophical theosophical but it's essentially it's the people of god we're the living testimony that god is telling his story in and through is that understanding that like you know whether my life exists on a very small seemingly mundane scale you know down in that lower ends of the hierarchy or whether you're you know up you know with the movers and shakers in the world really making things happen is wherever you land in that continuum, 
you have a fundamental responsibility and duty within the world to be a, a co-creator with God. And that's not something that can happen. Um, that's not something that just is a happenstance. That's, you know, the catechesis is, it would be similar to, you know, my son's a, he's my 15 year old is, is an artist. And so he, he spends an inordinate amount of time sketching mm -hmm. before he ever attempts that work. And that's like catechesis is the sketching is getting in there and, and learning the mechanics of this, you know, of this now, you know, you know, millennia old tradition that, you know, has incredible, you know, incredible aspects to the tradition from beginning to end. It's really wonderful. And if you know, you know, if you know how to use those, you know, use that palette well, it, it sets you up in a way where that creativity is enhanced. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Jeb, when you were you were sharing when you were sharing that bit from from Jordan uh, about the way we 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 co-create the world, um, first of all, a that's very Barfieldian, <laughs> and uh, and then the other thing the other thing about that I don't know you you know our did you see the our mutual friend Yosef uh, our, our mutual Jewish friend Yosef did you see the post that he had uh from that he shared from a rabbi friend of his at he he posted it like right when hostilities first broke out between israel and hamas I didn't. I didn't. where he was taught he it was a reflection on what it means to be created in, in the image of god and how god chooses every every person to come into existence and that and it also contains this notion that a person is that that a person is a world Mm -hmm. which that's actually in Bulgakov too, to a certain extent in Jacob's ladder, he talks about like how that's one of the things that distinguishes human beings from the angels is that human beings have a world or one can even say in a sense, they are a world, which actually made me think of like the line from the Fos Hilarion that we have in our tradition to be glorified through all the worlds. Yes. Mm -hmm. All the worlds. That made me think about that, like in, in connection with the idea of, of a, a, a person as a microcosm and hence a world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, as a multiverse guy, I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> to, to say this again, just wrinkling back for a moment or, or turning back to something earlier in the conversation about the second law of therm thermodynamics. I mean, in Romelli, one of the things that John Baer says about that, he draws it that connection back to origin, and that in a in fact I have it here on my desktop. Listen to this. Okay. Or, um, uh, Father John is the one connected this. So in in origin we get this line. I'm going to open up here. So this is the first principles, that Father John's translation. Mm -hmm that i could have this is a long quote and i'm looking for the specific part where he says finally the fact that it says god your god anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows psalm 44 or psalm 45 shows that that soul is anointed in one way with the oil of gladness that is with the word of god and wisdom and his fellows that is the holy prophets and apostles in another way so you're anointed with the oil of gladness from the word and from the prophets and apostles in, in different ways for they are said to have run in the fragrant fragrance of his ointment song of songs one four while that soul was the vessel containing the ointment itself of whose glowing heat all the prophets and apostles are made worthy partakers therefore as the fragrance of the ointment is one thing and the substance of the ointment another so also is christ so also christ is one thing and his fellows another and just as the vessel itself which contains the substance of the ointment can in no way accept any foul smell. Yet it is possible that those who participate in its fragrance, if they move a little away from its glowing heat, may accept any foul smell that comes upon them. So also in the same way, it was impossible that Christ, being as it were the very vessel in which was the substance of the ointment, should accept an odor of an opposite kind, while his fellows, in proportion to their proximity to the vessel, will be partakers and receivers of his fragrance. Now, you need to read the entire the entire piece. He's talking about Origen and Athanasius, Christ drawing divinity out of the Father, and then us drawing divinity out of divinity and humanity out of Christ. But this image of taking he he connects it specifically to that image of what we know physically is that heat is shared or lost, 
right? That we have to draw heat out in mm-hmm. order to live. And his, his contention is this metaphysical insight. That's what all being is. Being is participating in by drawing out the heat of divinity or divine humanity mm-hmm. in into our being. I think that's a, it's, it's a, corroboration i think for well, you that know. that ties into the no- notion of god as like a, a, a fire too absolutely and, and I, I i woke up in the i everywhere. woke up in the middle of of the night like once like uh a while back with like i dream of i dream song i don't i'm not a musician but i dream songs i don't know why and i dreamt about i dreamt this song in my uh and the refrain in the song was that there's a burning heart in the heart of everything was the refrain in the song and and i i immediately got up and as soon as i woke up i googled it like surely i must have heard this somewhere and it's like no it doesn't exist Mm. so but that's that that i immediately thought of that like that's that heat metaphor it sounds like uh, elliot when he talks about um in four quartets when he talks about an eternity burning in every moment yeah yeah, and that that image I think is with us for for all the reasons, right? Not just for a reason, but for all the reasons. Mm-hmm. And what you know to bring this back to Bulgakov again, and what I love about him is that that I think is what I'm trying to name when I'm saying like the scope of his thought, the complexity of his thought, and yet it's all suffused with passion. With this, an example of this is you know what he says about can we want, can we truly pray for and desire the coming of the Lord? And he says, in some ways you can't because what you're asking for is the judgment of God. What you're asking for is the wrath of God. And it's not not natural for us to want that. And yet, and yet it's Jesus who's coming to us. It's Mm -hmm. Jesus, the one who's bringing this fire of God to to consume us with it. And and so we must want it. We can't not want it. It's what we want, the desire of God. And, and in fact, like, like, I think it's like, it's our fear of that judgment that is the root of the delay, I think. Like, that's like, collectively, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. collectively, there's a way in which the reason it hasn't happened yet is because of us living in fear of that judgment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and well it's, it's an interesting, I guess there's like, um, like, I had a few more questions, but because of just some of your, your most recent statements, Chris, like one of the things that I didn't want to leave this conversation without, and I don't know where you're at on time, um, but oh. it's just, it, so Bulgakov has probably one of the most lofty and radiant understandings of Christian theosis of anyone I've ever read. And this comes through in this essay as well, but just in terms of how does that connect to you within your tradition and, and maybe, um, you know, how can we take that really high lofty sense of theosis and see that integrated within our Christian communities? Yeah, I, I think we're, yeah, great question. And I, I think it is, you know, to come back to that language of the power and the glory, God's glory is not one at the expense of our shame or our humiliation. Mm-hmm. And when, when Christianity in the Protestant tradition goes wrong, maybe not just Protestant, but certainly there is a Protestant form of this. And you know, Pentecostals are broadly in that reform camp, even if they're you know unorthodox. <laughs> I mean, like they're, all of their theological commitments are reactions to reform. I think there's a way in which, Chris, like realistically, almost everybody that is lives in North America has absorbed culturally a certain amount of reform theology, even if they're Catholic or Orthodox. Oh, I agree. I, I think that's exactly okay. Right. I think I, I'm completely agree with you. And even the stuff we are committed to, you know, so I mean, I grew up amongst people who were very much non Calvinist, but all of their categories and all of their orientation to theology, insofar as they had any at all, was, you know, deeply reformed. You know, it's a, a kind of watered down Calvinism. Mm-hmm. All that to say, I think that we we often talk, and I think not just talk, we feel as if there's such a radical competition between God's glory and ours, God's power and ours, mm-hmm. that all that God wants from the world is our subjugation. Mm-hmm. And so in, in, in this reading, you know, what Job does when he falls down, you know, I, I've heard of you. Now I see you and I repent and dust it. I I bore myself and I repent and dust and ashes. There, there is a certain strain of American reformed evangelical 
whatever fits in those camps, right? And again, that's a there's a lot of variation across those traditions. But where we we think that that's what God wants from us, and that what that's what God wants for us, that that kind of groveling before God, mm-hmm. and you know, when the, when the prodigal comes home, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll I'm, make sure to put a link to your sermon. God is not a master in the show notes. <laughs> right. And everything I believe, as far as I can tell, mm-hmm. is in opposition to that. Mm-hmm. I think that there's, God means to make us equals. Yeah. Nothing less than that. That yeah. God, that this work of making us persons is precisely in order to make us equals. And, and he's not going to stop. I mean, he's not going to stop, but there's no, He's not stopping short. God's word is not stopping short of bringing us up into full equality with God. And in ways that are true to what we are, go back to something we said at the very, very beginning here. Mm -hmm. Like we are not God. And precisely in that not being God, we are being brought up into this graced share in equality with God. If, if, we're going, if we're going to believe that the desire to, to see God face to face is one that can possibly be granted and that we are called into friendship with God, equality automatically follows from those two observations. You don't understand what the what those things meant to antiquity if you read those kinds of things and and it doesn't occur to you that they're that they they have to, they absolutely imply equality mm-hmm. absolutely completely agree and i think the language of scripture demands this in all, all kinds of ways we are joint heirs with christ right yes. we are meant to know as we are known right i call you no longer slaves i call you friends the bride of christ i mean i think scripture's chock full of that that language but it's telling that we're troubled by it. I mean, one of the, I get so much pushback when I talk about it or I, and I think the pushback comes from our piety is a piety of God's glory being bought at the expense of our shame and humiliation. Mm -hmm. And that this is why, you know, we, God loves us as sinners because as sinners, we know our brokenness. And as we own our brokenness, then God's mercy is revealed and god's justice i mean and i think all, it's all bullshit like i i could not be more opposed to that than yeah, i am right if i i want to be more opposed than i am and i'm as opposed as i know how to be so i i think the, the that ties I, directly chris that ties directly to my point about like like the cause of the delay is our fear of judgment like i'm not mm-hmm. kidding when i say that like there's a way in like is as long as we allow that to to hang around within us like my friend luke who often live streams on my platform he has he calls it pos theology and <laughs> let the reader understand <laughs> yeah, well, right exactly well and this this the, the like to your your point chris too is like that the you know god's glory is not being displayed or manifest uh th- in and through you know our you know dereliction and degradation it's it's being communicated in and through his own yes right it's a it's a cruciform reality so god is most present when he cries out god where are you absolutely you know why have you forsaken me and there's the there's this like and that's where i love john bear's writing so much Mm -hmm. is i feel like there's a central there's a centrality of the cross and the whole question of theosis And the whole question of how the divine life is actually structured and expressed in the finite order of things is it's, it's give, you know, in a sense, like what's happening at the cross? Well, it's life. The life that is God's life properly is being given and poured out as and for the life of the world. And so whatever our experience of glory and power, it's, it's, it's almost a, almost a total inversion from our, the way we conceptualize it naturally in our fallen state is this is actually being expressed theosis is is being expressed when we grasp it the least it's like biscuits right you you don't overwork the dough you know like (laughs) we've had omelets we've had biscuits i mean we've 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 got a lot going here on the on the table (laughs) yeah and and so i just i i think that there's that that sense of and I, i think that like you know in my experience within you know, in and around charismatic communities is there's that power and glory sense, Mm -hmm. but it's still kind of framed within that, 
you know, world that Max Weber kind of describes as like this, the kind of like the cultural Calvinism that is late capitalist societies. Um, we tend to think of that in terms of winners and losers. Um, and that's not the, that's really not the, the direction that God's calling us into. And we're called to look into and search out his glory and to experience that and to experience his power is there's a sense where that power of God is expressed in and through our powerlessness. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And we, we have to talk paradoxically. We have to talk, you know, uh, to, to finish the answer to your question. I mean, I think what Maximus says is that we are meant to share in the uncreated life of God. Mm -hmm. And, and that nothing, nothing less than that, nothing short of that is the completion, right? Mm -hmm. That we're talking about, unto ages of ages is that we we are meant to share in the infinity of god in such a way that our finitude is changed but not violated mm -hmm. so that so that we and this this is what i think we mean when we talk about holiness mm -hmm. like the holiness of god is what it is that makes it so that god can be with us in ways that make us good and draw us toward god's own goodness mm -hmm. but never undoes the good we already are so there's more goodness and more goodness and more goodness but not by the effacing or the ablating of the good that was already there, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to undo one good to bring about another. Yeah. Again, it's not one finitude in rivalry with another finitude. Yeah. And he's not moving us up. And this is why if we read Dionysius as arguing for that kind of hierarchy, then you do have a, a serious problem, right? But it's not that, right? It's, it's the mixing, the confecting, the, the bringing together, the drawing together, the harmonizing, of all of these goods into something more and more and more expansive. Yeah. And, and also not only harmonizing more and more, but also the fugue in which we're getting you know, movements also uh, that work seem to work against each other so that we have to say in Christ, all opposites coincide. Mm -hmm. right? They're, they're drawn together so that the, the, the weeping and the, and the rejoicing belong together, right? So when Paul says something, when his pastoral advice is weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, that's precisely what we're, that's what persons, not individuals, are capable of. Mm -hmm. Persons are capable of weeping and rejoicing in ways that aren't confused and yet are mixed. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think the incarnation has, has brought about and this, you know, to bring up Jordan's name in vain one more time, this is why creation is an incarnation, because it is the God confecting all things into the aroma of I Christ. I should have just invited Jordan. <laughs> well, and, and there's that, there's that like right. quality to return to time. Time is, it kind of spectralizes. So to use like Dionysus is like, we can, we can, you know, peer into that uncreated light that we experience as glory, but it's also like his concept of like the dazzling darkness, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Those are two, on the finite plane, two extraordinarily different experiences of God. Yes. Right. Experiencing God in his absence. Opposed. Or, I mean, it's not just different, but opposed. Yeah, they're they're opposites. And there's something delightfully Hegelian in that. Like the manifestation of essential reality can only be manifest in its finite contradiction. Right. So when, you know, God does something at the cross that God can't do, he dies. Right. That's that's where divinity is fully manifest. The essential reality of who God is is, is on display. Well, same kind of thing in in presencing and absence, like or you know in in Hardy in terms of of hiddenness and manifestation, right? Is I, to in those moments where I experience God as absent, that is just a temporal spectralization of a an experience that transcends both, you know, my ability to articulate His manifest presence and His manifest absence. Mm -hmm. right but they're both encompassed and so time allows us to in a sense experience those as difference yeah and i think that's beyond time I'm... they're the one thing well yes and no so this is where where i'm jensonian in that i think when we talk about beyond time we need to hear the timeliness and timefulness of god not mm -hmm. sheer timelessness mm -hmm. so that there's not an there's not a vacuity in god there is this overabundance of time that whatever whatever the grace in God as uncreated, mm -hmm. we know as created time, whatever yeah. that is, right, is a is a superabundant 
overflowing fullness of experience, not mm. the lack of one. Right. Right. And I, I mean, I know we're on the same page, but there's a way in which like I, I'm too deeply stamped by Jensen not to say right. we never talk about timelessness with God. We just well, mean to, at the mercy. Of there's time. a way in which I want to connect time to perspective, and I'm not quite sure why, but which is why the idea of timelessness is is ridiculous because there's there's you couldn't have no perspective whatsoever, but you could have all but but you could have all conceivable perspectives. You could have and all possible in a, points, in an inconceivable of, one, yeah, right, all possible points of view. That's right, and I think this again the. This is where if we had good catechesis, it comes to, you know, there's this line in Jensen. I, I just preached about this recently at our, our uh, one of the House of Bishops meetings. Jensen says that the, what protects our preaching, our liturgy, and our, our pastoral care from superstition mm -hmm. is the strictest Cerulean Christological orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I mean, I love this. I love it in part because of the groans it got from the audience when I said it, but I, I, all I would add to that is not, it's not, it can't just be Cerulean. It has to be full bore Neo-Chalcedonian, right? Like it, it needs to be Maximus and it, but still, yes, that line, right? That when we see that, then we recognize that the, all of this is happening. All opposites are coinciding in Christ and all mm -hmm. that is opposed to God has been overcome. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a matter of time before all of that can be, reconciled in us as it's already reconciled in jesus yeah. and what gets us there is this coming to know coming to share coming coming to be part of take part of his experience of our experience so i just on on sunday i i brought this up in the sermon right to recognize that whatever happens to me jesus takes it more personally than i do that whatever mm. you do or say to me you sin against me betray me lie about me whatever else Jesus takes that to heart as not just something done to someone he loves, but done to him. And if we really understood that, like if we genuinely do it, then of course we wouldn't fear the judgment, right? To your point, Nate, about yeah. what's, what's causing the delay, the delay is our fear of what in fact is our only hope, right? Mm -hmm. And that is this, this full, complete knowing as we are known. And, and the fire that consumes everything that can be consumed, the earthquake that shakes everything that can be shaken. Even if we do have, even if we do have a negative judgment coming our way, our fear of that is still a blockade because yeah. that judgment is ultimately for our good. It is our healing. That's exactly right. Exactly. Right. Because so, you That's don't want to be, you don't want to be, and I think that this is the hard part about judgment that none of us like to talk about. But I mean, I, I've accumulated plenty of contradictions throughout my life, right? And really, in, in a way that, <laughs> in a way that maybe even Hegel himself would blush at, right? <laughs> is like there, there is a sense where, like, I cannot be complete without that judgment. Like my exactly story right. cannot there is no denouement there is no movement into the next chapter until these things have been reckoned with and it will require that evaluation and that judgment for me to gain an understanding of what i have missed yeah right and and so it's like that is redemption it's just redemption in a in a more of an intense the intensification of that experience but you know and that ties into like george mcdonald and his concept of like the you know the unquenchable fire is like, I'm going to have to get used to that fire one way or the other, because it's going to keep burning. And if I, and if I don't pass through that inflection point of judgment, where what is good in me is vindicated and what is, what is bad in me is getting dealt with. Mm -hmm. And it's, it has been dealt with, it's been dealt with at Calvary, but the outworking of that and the existential experience of that, I think that the judgment holds out for each of us. You know, it's terrifying because we, we want to be vindicated in ourselves as opposed to that vindication that comes from beyond that word that comes from the outside that it ultimately vindicates. And that act of judgment is the act of redemption. And we don't, you know, we don't talk about those in those terms. And so the, the judgment is, you know, either we make a cartoon of it in like our Christian rendering of, you know, it's like this, you know, uh, you know, like this eternal torture. Well, it's, there's a way or, in which it's the thing that makes us finally real. Right. 
because right. you, you can't like until you've been judged there's a way in which you are you are incomplete and you can't be re- you can't be remembered and there's a I, there's a way in which i also want to connect remembrance to this idea of resurrection because of the connection because of the deep connection to forgetting and death mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like that sure. so the general resurrection is like god remembering everything all at once that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's indistinguishable from the word in the beginning. You know, the, now we're back to Eliot one more time, right? Mm-hmm. That for God, end and beginning are one in ways that, you know, Jesus, one of his teachings, the first shall be last and the last first. He does not mean that there will no longer be any firsts or lasts. But that there will be a way in which firsts and last now exist in the way that they exist for God. Right. And and have always in God existed in that way, mm-hmm. right. but not in our knowing of them, not in our experience of them, not in the way that they seem to be happening to us and what we said to ourselves, not in what we said to ourselves about what was happening to us. Mm-hmm. And I, I I do want to add this too, though, to the conversation. I don't think, and this is a place where I differ from Jen's. And I think, I think I'm closer to where Bulgakov is, but again, I'm not, I don't have the same level of familiarity with him, but I do want to say when I, when I say all good opposites coincide in Christ and that all that opposes God is overcome in him, I do not think that our sins become essential to what God is making of us. I think what God is doing. No, because the sins are the one thing that we were promised will be forgotten. Yes, they're forgotten. Exactly. They are forgotten. <laughs> so I think the ways in which I sin has to be answered for. I don't think anybody's getting by with anything. You know, to go right. back to George McDonald one more time, like I will pay the uttermost farthing for all for all of my contradictions, you know, for my mm-hmm. sins against my children, against my wife, against myself, against mm-hmm. my parents, against my neighbor. All, all of those sins I will answer for, answer for to the full. Mm-hmm. What Calvary does is not m- somehow steal from me my answerability for my wrongs. It enables me to face them. Mm-hmm. It enables me to bear them. But my having done wrong is not then made into some good. But there are goods that God does in my wrong that become essential to who I am. Right. So I, I think we this is right. really hard to say well, but we have to say that. Right. That the the wrongs I do and the wrongs done to me are not reified by God into something essential for me. Yeah. Like there really is, there are things that do not belong to God's knowing of things. Right. And I, I think Aquinas is helpful here in summing up the tradition. Right. That it since God does not know our sins, he knows that we have sinned because of the damage it does. Mm-hmm to our humanity and to the world and to the humanity of our neighbor, right? So the, the effects of sin are known, but not like the sin itself. Like it's, it's genuinely unthinkable for God. Yeah. And I think that's really, that must tell us something about how God would know us. In fact, I think when, when we talk about God forgetting our sins, I think it's just another way of saying God knowing us that when he knows Nate, he knows the fullness of that person. And, and again, we're back to, not this just what you did last Tuesday or something. Absolutely. He knows the fullness of who you are. In fact, I, I love, and I, I mean, this my first Bulgakov book was actually Jacob's Ladder. Okay. That was the first thing I read by him. And I've since then clung to this notion that when we're talking about a guardian angel, we are talking about a created witness to the fullness of our personhood. Mm-hmm. That is caring for us throughout all of our lives so that it, for God, I'm already realized. I'm always already fully this person he knows as his equal, as his friend. Mm-hmm. Right? And th- that's the one he's speaking to and calling to in my heart in, in, in a- any given moment. That's the one that is called and anointed and, and moved. Mm-hmm. And that is is known as I know it in part as this guardian angel, right? That beholds the face of the Lord. One of the examples of this is the, and I can't remember if Volgakov makes this connection or if I made it some other way, but you know, when Peter is in prison and the church is praying for him and 
he he is released and knocks on the door and Rhoda comes to the door. She runs back to the prayers and says, Peter's angel, or Peter is here. And they say, no, 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 it is his angel. Mm. It's his angel. And I, I hear in that, this kind of witness to like, there is something God has made that bears witness to the fullness of what I am. And the, it's that, that God knows that I'm becoming and that knowing all that, all the wrong that I have done as it is answered for, as it is addressed, it's also healed in such a way that it becomes unessential to my identity and to. Yeah, well, Gacko has this, this idea that he talks about in Jacob's ladder and also in, uh, on, in the apocalypse of John book about the, 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 the co-angelicity of humanity yes. and, and, and the co-humanity of the angels Yes. And he uses he uses the 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 measures of the gates of 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 the New Jerusalem as having the measure of an angel as a, and a measure of a man as mm. a scriptural reference for that idea. I love that. You know, Origins already said that. I mean, that's that's when he talks about you know commenting on Hebrews about Christ did not become like one of the angels, but became one of the human beings. Origins says, but in order to become like a human being, he's already taken on, and you know what Bulgakov would call angelicity. So I think, obviously, we're in deep waters there. But that's what, again, that's what I love about Bogaka that he <laughs> yeah. forces us out yeah. into. Well, he he yeah. does this stuff. I mean, for me, like, I mean, I, you know, I probably have given away a little bit of my cards in terms of, like, creativity. I have no problem creatively finding the edge of every envelope. Like, that's just, I find that naturally. Um, but the implications of maybe, like, Jordan's work, you know, um, or within Bulgakov's work is this tantalizing sense, uh, especially with Jordan, like if creation is incarnation, and there's something foundationally human about the whole enterprise, right? So when we're looking at Absolutely. the that question of what, what are angels or, you know, like a really weird sci-fi, you know, what are aliens and all this kinds of stuff, if not like finite embodied creatures or just a human by another name right is that there's a there's a humanity that's woven in deep into the heart of what creation is and although we inhabit this very small space within space and time in the universe as we know it like there's this um this deeply everlasting and transpatial reality that we exist within because we have that that intimate connection to both the angelic mode of mode of being and the human mode of being and you know is is just just simple it, it's different different ways uh you know you have like on an octave you got seven different notes these notes can can make and modulate sound in different ways but it's all coming from one unitary spectrum mm -hmm. right and so it's the way god is extending himself out in creation and we find ourselves as image bearers um kind of caught up in that same symphony that um that i think yeah, I think it, it it invites the mind to think in some fairly radical directions. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and and if we're doing it well, there should be a kind of giddiness to it because of recognition that, again, and this is how I hear it, you know, when Jesus directs attention to, you know, you're scandalized by the fact that it's claimed that I'm the son of God, but your own scriptures say, right? You are God. You are God's. Yeah. And I... I think we're as long as we're caught in that competitive framework in which God's glory is bought at the expense of our shame, and we have a hierarchy of winners and losers, winners and losers, right? Those who are closer to winning and those who are, are, are furthest from it. That end, and if the last judgment is for us, is just the sorting of winners and losers. So these are the people who receive their eternal reward, and these are the people who receive their eternal condemnation. If that's if that's our framework, then it's not just that our theology is going to go wrong. I mean, it's already gone terribly wrong to get to that point. It means we've done something to our own humanity and to the humanity of God mm -hmm. in that process, right? Mm. We we have we have violated who we are. We've shamed ourselves and therefore shamed God, right? We're 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 doing deep damage to our own being. And that being is nothing but ultimately, essentially, it is nothing but the life of God being shared with us. 
Yeah. And I, I think that is, you know, the, that line in Hebrew is about crucifying the son of God afresh. Like that's what we're doing. That's what mm -hmm. we're doing. When we speak and act and feel and respond and react in, in those ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Chris, like I, I, yeah, if you have a last question because we've kept Chris. I don't have, I don't really have any, anything else to, to ask okay. you or to realistically add, but was there anything like, you know, that you wanted to add to, to kind of wrap us up here? No, well, I just to thank you to you guys for doing this. I mean, for having me, obviously, but I mean, just doing this kind of work. I mean, I, I think the making the internet, a part of our parish, like being online in ways in which we are bearing witness to divine humanity. I mean, I think that that's good work and thank you for doing it. I'm glad to get to just pull up to the table for well, we We enjoy your work as well, Chris. So thank you, thank you for joining yeah, us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris. It was, it was just a pleasure to be able to sit here and, and pick your brain a little bit yeah and around yeah someone i'm deeply grateful for so bless you both and we'll talk soon okay